Hello everybody, I am Paul Ducklin from Sophos Naked Security, back for another week's Facebook Live video. And as you can see, this week's topic is Hafnium, all in capitals, like I'm shouting, explained in plain English. And uh, if you I just want to show you the, the page that I... This is what went out. I think you may have seen that on Twitter. That's how I advertised it. There is a joke hidden in there. It's a very risque joke. Uh, my wife said, no, don't make that joke. Some people might get offended. Um, but I did it nevertheless, and I'll explain that joke in a minute, because I think it's screamingly funny. You may not agree. So you've probably heard this story, Hafnium, and you've seen the all caps, and it's been the big story of the past week, and it's still unfolding. The problem is that exactly what this whole Hafnium thing means is confusing enough on its own, and that's one of the things that I want to tackle today. So some people have asked us at Naked Security, hey, it's all in capitals, you know, like uh, CD-ROM, or RAM, or... MS-DOS or something like that. Is it an acronym? Does it stand for something? And I suppose it could stand for highly aggressive fanatical network intrusion undermining Microsoft. Uh, it could stand for hacker alchemy finds network insecurities using magic, but it doesn't. In fact, I don't know why it's become all caps. My understanding is this is just a name that Microsoft uses to refer to a particular cyber gang. Apparently, uh, these guys operate out of China. Uh, and hafnium is a transition metal. It's uh, element 72 on the periodic table, I do believe. Uh, it has some use in nuclear reactors because it can slow down neutrons, apparently. Uh, so, you know, for all we know, this gang could have been called Lutetium or Copernicum or Darmstadtium or... Mm, Mendelevium or something like that. And actually, that's the joke. I'll just quickly, I, I better tell you what it is. The joke, and this is really, really naughty. You see that I put a picture of, of hafnium, the metal, little shavings of 99% pure hafnium metal in the background. Well, here's the really naughty thing. That's not hafnium in the background. It's lithium. How funny is that? Okay, so the deal is that hafnium actually refers, it's not an acronym, it doesn't refer to any particular sort of state of play. In fact, it's the name given to the cyber gang. But in the context of this attack, uh, it, of, the, of the attacks that are being discussed now, hafnium has kind of come to cover three different things. So firstly, it's the name of a particular cyber gang doing a particularly uh, nasty attack right at the moment. Secondly, it has come to refer to a bunch of zero-day exploits now patched by Microsoft in Microsoft Exchange that this gang was using to further their results. And thirdly, it's come to be used to refer to what these crooks were doing after they'd exploited those new vulnerabilities in order to take control over the web server part of any exchange system. And incidentally, I'll, I'll just put these up, but if you go to the, uh, those are, those are the, the actual CVEs. If you want to look them up, you freeze frame that and for later, or uh, you can simply go to, there's the article on Naked Security where we discuss this. There's actually a, supposed to be a shell showing the bottom there. You probably can't see that due to the contrast. But there's the article to have a look for on nakedsecurity.sophos.com. Uh, serious security, web shells explained in the aftermath of hafnium attacks. So the, the web shells are what came after the exploits, and the exploits were what perfor were performed by the gang. And hafnium has kind of come up, become a word that applies to all of those things. So here's why I think it's important to uh, basically de disambiguate that confusion. The first thing is that it turns out that hafnium, the gang, the crooks who are using these exploits, they're not the only guys doing it. In fact, they're up, apparently the other gang. I don't know who makes up these names, but they include names, names that I've seen associated with other guys who know about the same exploits and are using these same attacks against unpatched exchange servers include uh, Tick, Lucky Mouse, WebSick, Tonto Team, and even worse, it seems that somebody has now taken one of the patches, uh, one of those CVE numbers I just showed you, decompiled it or disassembled it, net and disassembled it now it's out, figured out how the vulnerability works, and created a working end-to-end -end exploit that anybody can use. 
So there are sort of proof of concept and working exploits floating around. So it's not Hafnium, although that's a gang, there are lots of gangs using these particular exploits. Basically, if you haven't patched your exchange servers, then you absolutely need to do so because it's not just one gang that may have taken a step back now they've been outed by Microsoft. There's a whole slew of different groups out there who are trying to make hay while the sun doesn't shine, if you like, by going after people who haven't patched yet. So the first thing is Hafnium, although it refers to a gang in this attack, there are lots of other cyber gangs at the same time using the same trick. The second thing is that this Hafnium group, they don't exist just because they found these zero days. They've been around for quite some time. It's just that the exploits that I showed you, those four CVs that I put on the screen now, those are just the exploits, the way that they're using at the moment to break into servers and sites where people are using Exchange. It doesn't mean that if you're not using Exchange, you're somehow magically super more secure than anybody else. And it doesn't mean uh, that these guys aren't going, haven't used different exploits before, and it almost certainly doesn't mean they aren't going to find and use other exploits in the future. And the third thing to remember is that uh, you, you notice I showed you that article about understanding how web shells work, because you'll have seen that news in the media, I'm sure. Web shells are what these crooks have been using as a what you might call a post-exploitation mechanism for taking over your server and doing malicious, nasty stuff. It seems the Hafnium guys like to steal data. They're quite interested in stuff they can get off your network. But as we know, there are, there are a few cyber crooks these days who concentrate on one and only one thing. As we know, the, for example, ransomware crooks, they steal your data and scramble your files and all other stuff in between. So the other thing is that what comes after these exploits, these web shells, they're not uniquely associated with this particular attack. That's a general technique that you need to learn how to defend against anyway, because if the crooks can get in a one-time access, say, with a password or via some other vulnerability in some other software, they can still use this web shell treachery as a vehicle for compromising your network at any time. So the problem is there's sort of threefold misunderstanding about what half well, fourfold misunderstanding about Hafnium. Firstly, it's not an acronym. It doesn't. An, it's not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything. Um, secondly, although it refers to a gang that that, that is has got its renown now for this particular attack, they're not the only gang doing the attacks. The third thing is that these exploits that they're using now, it's not what they're going to be using next week, it's what not what they were using a week or two weeks or a month before. So the fact that you've patched against these exploits doesn't mean you have neutralized this gang, it just means you have neutralized the vehicle for this particular attack. And the last, the fourth thing is, of course, that the, the stuff you can learn about, about what they're doing after they've used these particular chain of four exploits to get into your network, this whole web shell trickery, that's something that it, that's an old, uh, an old trick widely used by crooks. And I'll just go explain it now because I think it's important to understand that because web shells have been, have been used before. They're being used in this attack. They will be used in the future. And there are rather tricky, they can be tricky to understand. Everyone thinks they know what they mean. So let's just go through and make sure that you do or make sure that if you need to explain them to other people, uh, you're, you're able to do that. So the big deal uh, with a web shell, the, the reason why web shells are important in this attack is my understanding that if you chain these exploits together correctly, uh, you can do a, a, series of, uh, a series of things. So you can kind of get in without a password you can boost your privilege so you can actually get access to more of the system than you otherwise would have if you were just exchange. And lastly, the last thing that you can do if you use the exploits correctly is you can write an arbitrary file of your choice to an arbitrary location on the server. Now, the thing that we know that crooks love to do, it's, it, it, actually it's dangerous enough if they can just write a file somewhere on your server, even if it's just into your web, the folder where your web site files are stored. Because if they can replace one of your HTML files with one of their own, then they can feed fake news to your customers. They can feed malware to people who visit your site, so you're acting as a malware delivery network. They can do crypto jacking, where they send crypto mining code to other people's computers. They, they can uh, serve fake ads, all sorts of stuff that at the very best would make your brand look terrible. So just getting right access to a server is bad enough. The thing comes though that how does right access to a server give you 
execute access or remote code execution. Because if I can drop a file on your server, maybe I can put it in a place that when you next reboot it might load. But that could be days or weeks or months away, depending on how often you'll reboot your servers or do your patches. Um, so why is write access to a something like a web server dangerous? And where do web shells come in? And the reason is that if you can put a file into the web folder that's used by a web server to serve up stuff. Most, not all, but most web servers don't just serve these days what's called static content. So static content might be HTML that looks something like that. So that's the, that's the world's second simplest HTML file. It's just a para some paragraph text that, text that says hello. And generally speaking, if you're running, say, Microsoft IIS, Oh, this is what I used for. If you go to the article I showed you at the beginning, I show you how to do all this stuff so you can learn about this yourself in safety without hacking anything on a computer of your own, say a virtual machine. So you can find out how all this works. It's actually quite easy and quite fun to do. So if you put a file like that, say called hello.html, into your web server directory, then anybody who visits your web server can force your web server to read in that file and send it back to you simply using a web browser. So accessing a file that a crook has placed on your server that they shouldn't have there, anybody, the crook or a legitimate visitor, can access that file accidentally or by design simply by visiting a URL with a browser. So they don't need a login, they don't know to access via a VPN, they don't need any credentials. Your web server is supposed to accept traffic and serving up files that might be legitimate or not legitimate, they might have genuine content or fake news in. That's something that you can do if you control the content of pure HTML files. The problem comes that, like I said, most web servers these days, not all, there's a whole school of thought that says you should avoid this if you can in web servers, and there are approaches that say we're only going to serve static files. So what you see is what you get. The problem is, for many web servers, they allow what's called server-side scripting. So if you have a file, say, on IIS that's called something.html, IIS will go, oh, that's a plain file. It'll read it in and serve the file exactly. But if you rename it to something like hello.asp, which is short for active server pages, if you're using Linux or Unix, then you're probably familiar with things like PHP. So a file called hello.php, it won't be quite the same, but a very similar idea. So if you have a file called ASP, and it contains HTML like that. Now, that's not valid HTML. If you know your web stuff, you'll know that angle bracket percent, percent angle bracket, those aren't legal HTML tags. But the trick is that when you visit a page like that uh, via IIS, and it just happens to have the file name something.asp, that is not the file that gets sent to the visitor to your site. What happens is that page is sent to a scripting engine. The default is VB script, Visual Basic script, uh, but you can configure IS to use JavaScript, C Sharp, PHP, lots of different scripting languages. So what happens is when that file gets sent to a user, it doesn't get sent as it is. It gets sent to a scripting engine on the server first, and the results of what happens in that scripting engine determines what goes back to the user. And in fact, in that example, what that script does equals now brackets brackets. What that does is say, run the VB script uh, function called now, which just gets the time and data as a string, text string, and equals means send that back as inside the HTML page. So the user, when they see that page, the visitor doesn't see that script. They see the result of the script. So what that means, actually, is if a crook can write a file into your web directory somewhere, and call it something something dot ASP and include a script in it, then just being able to write that file essentially gives them write access and remote code execution access because all they need to do to trigger that script on your server is visit the URL relevant to the, pe the, to the file they just dropped. And unfortunately, here I'm, we just print the name, the date would be uncontroversial, but inside that VB script or JavaScript or whatever it is, inside a server-side script, you can actually write programs that are incredibly complicated. And even worse, you can actually, in VB script, JavaScript, C sharp, PHP, etc., you can actually run external programs. So you have a script on the server that's running a program on the server. It could go out and download other stuff. It could do almost anything that it wants. And that can be triggered 
simply by visiting a web page. So by implanting a web script on your malicious web script on your server, a crook can then get remote execution of it by visiting the right URL. And they'll know what that is because they'll know the name of the file that they uploaded. It might replace one of yours or it might be a new file that you've never seen before. And where that gets worse is, unfortunately, in the script, the stuff that you see there in pink, it's actually possible in the scripting language on the server to extract from the incoming web request, either from the URL or from the body of the web request itself, you can actually extract data and process it in the script. You can see why that's useful. It's how things like search pages work. You make a query. It has a search term either in the body or in the URL. The script sucks the search term out of your URL, goes and does the search on the website, builds a page, sends it back. Perfect use case. Unfortunately, what it means is if the crook has a script that can run external programs, for example, a web script, a malicious web script, then by having what's called a malicious web shell, the web shell doesn't run any specific command. It runs the command that the crook just sent in in the URL and the body of the tech of the body of the request. So now, as well as having remote code execution, the crooks have completely generalized remote code execution. So by using nothing more complicated than a web browser and without logging in at all, they can actually connect to your server including the request they're making, the name of a command with some arguments that they want to run, and your server will run their command on your network. So you can imagine that it's almost limitless what they can do at this point, assuming they have the correct privileges. And remember, there is a privilege, elevation of privilege uh, bug uh, vulnerability in that chain of four exploits that I mentioned. So the deal here is that when you're reading about the Hafnium attack, there's a lot more to it than just, oh, well, what does Hafnium mean? And, oh, it's a gang. Well, I'll watch out for those guys. So let's very quickly look at what you can do, given that there's a lot of publicity about Hafnium and given that there's a lot of material out there, including on nakedsecurity.sophos.com and on news.sophos.com that can actually help you turn this to your advantage if you're fortunate enough not to have been hacked yet, you can actually use this as an excellent opportunity to go out and learn something about how this kind of crook operates so that you can be better, uh, defend against them better in the future. So obviously, three quick things. The first thing, you, abs you absolutely have to do this if you have Exchange anywhere in your network, uh, is you absolutely need to get those patches out. If you have delayed, do it right now. The reason is it's not just about Hafnium, it's about all those other wackily named gangs that I mentioned and anybody who cares to download the new proof of concept code that's out there. If you haven't patched, they basically have an almost guaranteed way to wander into your network and a whole load of articles all over the web explaining what to do when they get in. So patching is really important. The second thing you can do, and I'll just quickly show you as part of this tip, uh, two articles that you can go and look for. You can That article I showed you that I wrote about web shells, you can link through to them for there. But here's, here's one of them. That's on news.sophos.com. Uh, we've got advice about what to do. In other words, the specific actions you can take on your network for the, the mainstream attack here. And we have another article, which is, this is, it, it's designed a, as a specific response for Sophos customers, so it gives you things like the names we use to detect this stuff, so you know what to look for in your logs. But that article is actually of general value because it also includes a way to get what we call indicators of compromise. In other words, that, and that's my second tip. You can, if you want, go and look on your network for evidence that somebody has done an attack of this hafnium sort on your network right now. So it doesn't, it doesn't prove that nobody's in your network. Uh, if, uh, but it is a good way that if you have been targeted, unfortunately quite a number of people have, it's quite a good way of finding out whether, because you might have exchange, you might think, golly, I was a bit, it took me three days to patch. I wonder what happened, and the crooks knew about this in advance. I wonder what happened in that interim period. Uh, we have some indicators of compromise you can, Microsoft have as well on their, 
on, in, in their analysis of this threat. You can go out and find things that you can look for, which it doesn't actually prove if you don't find any of these that the crooks didn't get in, but it gives you a very, very high confidence that even though you may have been vulnerable at some point, you didn't actually get exploited. And if you did get exploited, it's a fantastic way of going, finding out what the crooks did, not just, oh, they got in, but actually going and undoing any of the damage that they may have done. Because remember, modern cyber crooks, they love to leave behind uh, backdoor holes where they can get in later. So you kick them out this time and they've left a hole that lets them wander in later. And the last, my third tip is simply, and th those articles are a great place to start, use this as an opportunity to go and learn about how things like web-driven intrusions work. Because not just as simple as knowing, oh, there's one gang out there because there are loads of them. It's not just as simple as knowing, oh, there's one lot of exploits because new exploits will come along. And it's not just as simple as knowing, oh, well, I need to look for this particular file that I knew was used in this attack. What you need to do is understand the general way that these attacks unfold because, um, as Sun Tzu said all those thousands of years ago in The Art of War, the best way to defend against your enemy is to know your enemy. So thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I hope you weren't too offended by, by my joke using lithium instead of hafnium. It was a little bit naughty. But thanks for watching, and until next week, stay secure.